Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inside the Birds. I'm Adam Kaplan. Jeff Mosher is on assignment. It, it, well, the assignment, we can't say it's secret. It, it's uh, it's secret out there. But filling in for us is our our, our buddy, Andrew DiCecco from InsideTheBirds.com. Andrew, glad to be back with you once again. Adam, always good to be with you. And uh, I always enjoy doing the pods whenever we get a chance. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. You'll definitely be with us uh, as we get closer to the draft. We are now officially in draft season. Yes, the Eagles will make some free agent moves before the draft. Most likely, don't expect anything major unless there's a trade. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, yeah, we are now draft season. We are four weeks away from the draft, and we cannot wait for that as we get closer now. And uh, we should always let people know that we are presented today by Ocean Casino and Resort, the exclusive Jersey Shore Casino sponsor of Inside the Birds. We love, Andrew, going down to um, to Ocean Casino. It is absolutely awesome uh, going down to Atlantic City. And as we get through this, Andrew, and we go to what content you provided uh, to us at InsideTheBirds.com, I know that you've been doing these for us for a while, these Eagles only mock drafts. So give us a, give us a cliff notes. Give us a little, a, a little, some broad breadcrumbs here. When yeah, we sure. go to the website, what could, what could we look forward to seeing here with your latest mock draft? Well, it, it's tough because, and with the second mock draft that I did, Adam, I looked at offensive line, knowing that that's the Eagles hallmark, right? But Troy Fontano from Washington is more than likely going to go a little bit higher than 22. So realistically, I couldn't mock him there. He obviously, as you know, you never want to take a pure guard at 22. So yep. I looked at it and I said, what have they What have they not addressed yet in free agency? And to me, that was corner, not in a big way. Tyler Hall is going to, he's a nickel guy. But Nate Wiggins from Clemson seems to be a guy that would slot right in there. Koi McKinstry is going to go a little bit after that but Wiggins is right there they need another young corner they got to develop a young corner along with Keely Ringo and Eli Ricks and those guys so that to me was was the big one there and then there's a surprise in the second round I went tight mm. end at Whoa. 53 Jatavian Sanders oh Sanders yeah okay yeah I, boy, believe this... it or not yeah, go Goddard's gonna be 30 as you know at, in January mm. and the Eagles are typically forward thinking so why not get a another young weapon that can really work the middle of the field. He's a really good with in, with contested catches, which is going to help Jalen Hurts be able to fit those balls into tight windows. And they also have a plan in place for when Goddard moves on or the Eagles move on from him, whatever whatever happens. So it's kind of like with the Hurts thing years ago. Yeah. That's, that was my thought process there. You know, it's funny. I said to Jeff Mosher weeks ago, I said, could this be the year that I've, I've probably said it three times now about could, that they could draft Goddard's replacement. But now, as you know, Andrew, covering the draft, it's, this is not a great tight end draft. Right. And a after Brock Bowers, I mean, it, it's hard to, I don't know that it, we'll see one in the second round. So your guy Sanders could be that guy. My guy's Ben Sennett, who will go later. Yeah. You and I saw him at the uh, senior ball, who had a very good week and kind of helped himself. But yeah, that the, the, you're right. The Eagles, one of the things when, when they're really doing it right is when they start drafting early. Because remember, the draft is about the future. Uh, with whatever you can get out of the guy year one is great, but you're always drafting for the future. And teams that do that consistently are the teams that keep everybody around. When you don't, when you start worrying about this year only, you're going to get fired. That's just the way it is. And you hate seeing that when GMs do that. But the Eagles generally are forward thinking. And we'll we'll see what that looks like. But we look forward to seeing your your Eagles only mock draft. And um, it, it's interesting because depending on when you do these drafts, Andrew, they could have traded away some of these picks. Who knows? So Exactly. Yeah, I think definitely. I think I have one more left in me, right, right as we okay. get closer to the draft, and then you, me, and Jeff always do that entire yep. first round one, which I always look forward to. So that, 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 I'm all mocked out after that. <laughs> and you could you could see my uh, my mock draft at uh, ProFootballNetwork.com, and I at 22, I have uh, I definitely have um, a surprise. Uh, I don't think the guy will make it there. Well, actually, he could. That's why I put him there. The player that I put there, but it depends on medical and. You can go there to read it. And then also in the draft, our first inside, uh, the actually the Intel with Greg Cosell, the first one on the draft. We started with receivers. This was awesome. Me, me, Jeff, and Greg had great information. Gre Greg's stuff was incredible. His intel and what the tape looks like. And uh, the, the cool thing is he and I had, I don't know how it came up. Uh, he and I had similar information on uh on JJ, J, JJ McCarthy, because we we're just talking about quarterbacks for a second. And, but certainly at Andrew at receiver, it's such a deep draft. And, and we're going to get into what you're, you're, you're doing for us in addition to writing for us, which is connected to where you're, you'll be going soon. W when you go to these pro days, Andrew, 
do you put a list together? Okay, here are the guys I want to want to see, and then sometimes you see more than that. But w- what is your thought process when you go to these pro days? Great question. So what I do is I make a list exactly like what you said. I make a list of who I want to see, who I want to talk to, certain testing numbers that I want to see, and well, I, I take a tally of what teams are there and who, what representatives. In this case, for the Eagles, are there. And and sometimes you'll see some intriguing local players, too, that, that might catch your eye when I look at the uh, at the list of who's going to be there. So that kind of uh, I add to the list. But that's usually when I'm getting set up. I, I have to there's certain guys that I pinpoint and wanting to see how they test in certain areas. And you and we'll talk about this right now. You you were just at the Temple Pro Day and we'll, we'll, we'll and later on the show, we'll go over what you saw. Is that a, is that a school this year that's got a lot of draft role players or what's the thought process of of that group when you look at it well jordan mcgee was the star of the show linebacker he added a four pounds since the combine six one two thirty two fast athletic fluid and he didn't he only did the shuttle l cone drill and he did the position work at the request of eagles linebacker coach bobby king ah. he mentioned that to me after practice after the after the workout so that was interesting. He got a lot of attention from scouts afterwards. He's an intriguing day three guy, and I think that his stock's starting to rise a little bit. Has okay. some top 30 visits with the Cowboys, Texans, had the Broncos already. Had a private workout with the Eagles last week. So he's he's definitely getting some traction here. And in, this is an alert, folks. The Eagles are actually taking interest in an off-the-ball linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and other than that, they have uh, Le- uh, Leighton Jordan, who's a okay. – pass rusher a hybrid guy and he's someone that that should be into a should get into a camp and my biggest surprise was someone who was from a school that i went to once upon a time lock haven university chris collier oh. running back 510 205 ran a 448 43 by some standards tested through the roof he was somebody that every scout was talking to afterwards he got himself into a couple pro uh, local days giants and jets talk to the dolphins on the phone after on the ride back to state college so he's he's putting lhu on the map a little bit there i'm intrigued i'm interested to see where he's able to go from there and build off of that all right so for more on that on the temple pro day go to inside the birds.com and read andrew's review of what he saw and what he heard uh one more thing we should mention on patreon we our chat this week was moved to a thursday night at 8 p.m eastern and then what we're going to do is we got a couple things we're going to announce soon uh, but we've got live streams the following two Wednesdays. And we also uh, are going to do our first chalk talk with a former contract negotiator, Samir Suleiman, who was the Panthers negotiator. He did the Miles Sanders contract. Uh, he, Samir also played football. He's one of the few contract negotiators, Andrew, that actually played football. He played with our friend John Filippo mm-hmm. at JMU at James Madison. Uh, Samir was a receiver. And he's a really sharp guy, worked for the management council, worked for the Rams uh, f- for a while, the Steelers, and uh, f- uh, lately for the Panthers. So we're going to we're gonna go over the Eagles' thought process and what, what, he, what he views it. And as we've said before from our sources, that uh, David Tepper, the owner of the Panthers, is very close to Jeffrey Lurie. And if there's anything that he noticed when he was with the Panthers that are similar to what uh, the Eagles do and so forth. So we're going to do that for Patreon. Uh, we're going to get Joe Banner on. I talked, talked to Joe last week. Joe's uh, been away, uh, but Joe's going to take care of us in April. So we're going to get him. And then we got a couple other announcements coming. So if you want to join that and our Discord channel, by the way, where we put exclusive information that, uh, well, this is, let's just say we get you ahead of transactions and information that's going to come out at some point. And uh, we we kind of give you the heads up on what the thought process is and do that at patreon.com slash inside the birds. So let's get started, Andrew. And the big news to to hit earlier this week was, and we'll explain kind of where this is headed and and uh, why it's happening so forth. Jake Rosenberg, uh, the Eagles VP of Football Administration, has been a lifelong friend of Howie Roseman. Uh, the two grew up together. Uh, Jake has announced that uh, he's leaving the team. He, he did a really good interview with uh, Jeff McClain in the Inquirer, which you could read. Uh, but this has been an open secret, just, Andrew, just to let people know, uh, Mosher and I have known about this for like three or four months. That we... It's any reporter who's covered the Eagles kind of most know this, that this is this was de- coming down the pike. And our understanding is that he's going to leave a couple weeks after the draft. And uh, Jake gives his on the record reason for, for wanting to leave. And 
it, it, he just wants to blaze his own path, wants to be a GM. Obviously, that's not happening in Philly. And let's not forget, Andrew, that uh, the Eagles have two assistant general managers. So those those spots are taken, and you know he's looking to blaze his own trail. He worked closely with Bryce Johnston uh, and Howie uh, doing contracts. But Jake is the guy who who not only helps Bryce out, Bryce is the one who designs a lot of their contract structure, but he's the guy, Andrew, who deals with a lot of agents. So have you talked to agents who've dealt with Jake over the years? Couple, a couple, because the name definitely was was, was mentioned uh, recently. So okay. he he's definitely somebody that that's that's mentioned when you when you're sort of talking about not only Howie but but uh, Jake's sure. name came up quite a bit. Sure. So what what our understanding is that once he's he leaves sometime in May, uh, Andrew Berry's brother, Andrew Berry's brother Adam Berry, who's the director of football operations and strategy, should take on more responsibility. See, Bryce Johnson is more of the contract designing type of guy. He doesn't really deal with agents like Jake did. And amongst all of Jake's responsibilities, that's that's one that's really important. And that's that's going to be missed because I'll tell you what, the Eagles have this great reputation of getting along with agents. We're not saying like Andrew, and you know you deal with agents. Not every contract negotiation is great. Sometimes they're contentious and all teams go through this, but when you have the reputation that the Eagles do with dealing with agents, it's good that you have a guy like Jake who has, has this background of working with agents and with him out of there. I don't know how that, you know, that that's something that's one of the many things that Jake was doing. That's really going to be missed because they always say tie, ties go to the r- runner, Andrew, if it's between two teams, sometimes you, you send your player to a team that you really respect and it's treated well. And as you know, Jeffrey Laurie and uh, the Eagles treat their players pretty well. So uh, we'll see what they do to fill that exact title and that that role going forward. So that's going on. That that uh, that 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 uh, that that was out this week. And you, again, you could re- read that at uh, uh, that the at inquiry. the inquiry on, on that situation. Now, let's move to the next thing. So we mentioned the Temple Pro Day, and give us an idea. It, you know, you talk about McGee, the linebacker. Mm-hmm. Next level, as as we start our, our draft coverage with you on today's show and, and going forward, we're pretty much going to be all draft the last four weeks. Unless the, we'll we'll review kind of where their team needs are and 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 what they're looking at towards the draft. But again, it, it's really draft coverage. So at Temple, what other things went? Were there any former NFL player, former Temple players there? And did you see a lot of scouts there from other teams? Hassan Reddick was there. Oh, he was okay. Yeah, Hassan really? Reddick was. Yeah, Hassan okay. Reddick was there, and there were reps star. from twenty, anywhere from between twenty to twenty-five teams, okay. and including many from the Eagles. Obviously, it's in their own backyard. Ben Ijelana and uh, Amina Solomon were there for the Eagles, uh, notably. So there, okay. there was a really good turnout, and obviously the main attraction, as I mentioned, was, was Jordan. So he got quite a bit of attention. But uh, there were there were some some guys there that had some really good workouts that that uh, I wasn't really expecting going into it. So here's a question for you. How many, just off the top of your head, how many draftable players do you think, just a ballpark idea of, of how many they would have on the roster? For Temple, just one. Yeah. It's, it's going to be McGee. But it's there's okay. Leighton Jordan, the edge rusher, should be able to get into a camp. A couple of those players that were local invites could get a mini camp invite, potentially uh, sign as an undrafted free agent. So. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I'm interested to see how that goes. If they're able to parlay that into something more, and maybe get some local days and, and catch some someone's eye. Because w- one thing that we've learned over the years, and it doesn't really pertain to the Temple Pro Day, but because you just you mentioned McGee, the linebacker, the off the ball linebacker w- should be drafted. But some teams, in fact, many teams, depending on what the schedule is, in a particular week, sometimes they don't send scouts to a pro day if it if it if a school does not have a draft or player more often than not, they don't send players there. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware that we, we, uh, we know some teams didn't send anyone to the, the Delaware pro day. Right. If, look, if you don't think Je- Je- a, Jeff and I were there. <laughs> yeah. You were there. You know that. Yeah. I were the, so we didn't, did you guys not see Eagles people there? Cause I, I'd heard there were didn't, didn't see one, one Eagles right. person there. Cause that, that's what we were told. There are some teams that are not going to some pro days because Let's say you only you have ten scouts, right, or eight, whatever the amount is, six to eight scouts. If you've got fifteen pro days go on within forty eight hours, you can't go to all of them. You can't unless obviously you're going to go to the most important ones, but you can't go to every single one of them. So some teams just don't go to pro days. Now, the the workouts, the pro day workouts are are, are um, you know are taped. So 
also let, let, let's go back to that so for instance you've been a pro days at temples pro day what 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 kind of drills are they doing well we don't get to see the bench press or the measurements at least yeah. for temple but we're Del delaware we did but you're seeing the uh, the 40 yard dash the three cone drill the short shuttle the position work and and any teams that want to work out some of these guys further like the lions and the patriots worked out jordan mcgee afterwards so um that, that's that's pretty much what, what you see there they ran it really organized and and really fast and efficient but that's that's more or less what you see and then there's obviously the 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 pre stuff where they're measuring and they're they're doing the uh the vertical which we didn't see this time uh the oh and the broad jump we saw the broad jump too that was the first thing they did so the private so they do private workouts you can do them uh you know around the pro day i know that the clubs will work some guys out on the side we have you seen any of them? Could you see it from afar? Like, are you able to keep an eye on some of those? I don't know where they work them. They work them on a Jason Field. Have you seen any of that? Uh, not not thus far. But yeah. like I said, I know that Jordan McGee had a private workout with the Eagles last week. He, he'd mentioned that. Doesn't count as a, as a 30 visit because right. he's a local guy, as you know. So, yeah, I mean, other, other than that, I didn't see anything that, that caught my eye. Because the reason why clubs tell us that they do this, because, as you know, the pro days – are so structured they they want to give them some things that are different at these private workouts and sometimes look it it's just another way way to see them because as you know the the combine those those are those are somewhat similar to pro days but a little different it's just another part of the evaluation process these private workouts and also understand that you cannot work out players at your own building you could have them in for pre-jf visits uh where you could keep them there pretty much the whole day but you can't work them out now you have a local pro day where you can work out players that are local, but you cannot work out players who are not in your pro day, your, your local pro day. You could you bring them in, uh, you could bring them to the chalkboard, you could tape the meetings. You could also, by the way, give them a, a physical, which is important. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything is part of the process. And the by the way, the visits are going on like crazy right now. Uh, and, and by the way, let's get on those. So I know you had some some updates on some of the the uh, the pre draft visits, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Brendan Rice, son of uh, Jerry Rice, the great NFL Hall of Famer Jerry Rice, yep. is going to be visiting the Eagles early April. And yep. Trevin Wallace, the linebacker from Kentucky, who I've been on for a while, he is visiting, or he has already visited the Eagles, by the way. And there's there should be some stuff cooking. Today, uh, my understanding is that uh, assistant offensive line coach TJ Paganetti was at South Dakota State's Pro Day working out guard Mason or well, presumably to see guard Mason McCormick and tackle Garrett Greenfield so that is that that's another interesting uh development there uh, that he also went to Missouri's as I understand to see their tackle yeah. so um Aaron Moorhead went out to to tech I believe he went to go see uh Xavier Worthy <laughs> so I, I like to keep track of all this uh, of all yeah. this stuff what's going on oh now okay let's go to Worthy first what do you I, I've been told late first round pick Mm -hmm. uh I've was always gonna, always gonna be a top 40 pick but the speed not that anyone was surprised by it but this was obviously historic at the combine what do you like about worthy's tape well i like his explosiveness his ability to separate his releases off the line are very good and his ability to be just a a game breaker for but i, I still think that he needs a little bit more refinement uh from his from a route running perspective but i i mean just the dynamic traits that he has. I, I could see a team like the Kansas city chiefs grabbing yeah. them or something and adding to their embarrassment or riches. It wouldn't surprise me. Then they could, they got Hollywood Brown, a one-year deal. The kids that you were talking about, was it, do you say South, uh, South Dakota state or North Dakota state? South Dakota state. Now are those guys, those guys are draftable. Oh yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Mason McCormick is going to go a little bit earlier than, than some folks out, out there have, have projected really athletic. I believe he was a senior bowl guy too, if I'm not mistaken. They both went to the combine. So it wasn't really surprising to hear that he was there. Um, but uh, I'm interested then Mason McCormick in particular is a, is a mauler. He's a road grader and he's, he's pretty athletic. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on there. Okay. And then what other pro days you're going to hit and give us an idea of what you're going to be looking for there. Well, I'll be at Rutgers tomorrow or I guess Thursday. Yeah. Today. And, and going to go see uh, Max Melton who we've you we've got to see up close and personal at the, at the combine very athletic really good uh great interview by the way and he's going to be i'm not exactly sure what he's going to be participating in you may have more clarity on that on that but his testing numbers were through the roof of the combine so i can't imagine he's going to do 
the full gamut of, of workouts tomorrow. But And they also have a linebacker, Deion Jennings, who I'll be keeping an eye on as well. All right, so with Melton, our understanding is that uh, probably not going to do the 40 because his 40 was tremendous at the Combine. His senior ball was great. His Combine was great. He was always thought to be a mid-second round pick, we were told, before the senior ball. He has an outside chance of going late first, um, but he's certainly now a top 40 pick. It's not a great draft after the first couple corners, so he should be in that next tier. Uh, he's son of Gary Melton, who uh, was a terrific college football player, played a little bit in the NFL. Their mother uh, was a great athlete at Rutgers. You know, Bo Melton's with the, the receiver, was drafted by the Seahawks, is now with the Packers, who came on really late last season when they had injuries. Yeah. They had another brother, I believe, who played at Delaware State. I mean, this is an incredibly athletic family, high-character people, great people, and this is a, this is a great story. Uh, Rutgers doesn't put out a lot of first-round picks or top 40 picks, but he's got a chance to do it, and uh, we'll see what happens at that pro day. Then, and, and and you said, was there another one you're going to? Yeah, Maryland on Friday. There's yeah. a safety there that I really like that could go in round two or three, Bo Braid, and I want to see how he moves because when I watched him on tape, a little stiff, kind of remind me a little bit of a very good linear speed, but he kind of reminded me a little bit of Sidney Brown. I want to see how he's able to do because – his play speed is much faster than than I believe that he tested at the combine, and I want to see how he's able to do in the confines of his of Maryland's pro day. Um, and they also have a couple corners there too, Adam, that I really like that I'm looking to get uh, get some eyes on and and talk to some folks while I'm out there and and see where see what the uh, the latest is with them, where teams are sort of forecasting them. Okay. Well, we look forward to reading your accounts of that, what you heard and what you saw at InsideTheBirds.com. And before we take or hit on this next segment. Let's take a quick break. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. Hey, welcome back inside the birds. Adam Kaplan, Andrew Ducheco here with you as we are now four weeks away from this year's NFL draft. And I, I just got back a couple of days ago, uh, Andrew, from the owners' meetings in Orlando. And it was just great to be in warm weather, to be honest with you. But every year, um, Jeffrey Lurie, uh, the Eagles owner, he speaks once or twice. And Jeffrey spoke. Uh, that was the last of the three pre uh, three pressers of the Eagles uh, front office. And Nick Sirianni also spoke, and Harry Roseman spoke. So let's get first, Andrew, with um, our takeaways from what Nick Sirianni said. And there were a couple things that you know I was there, and I'm I'm five feet away from the guy. I typically don't answer questions here. I just listen in and and for my own opinions. The one thing that kind of – I don't understand why he does this, Andrew. Now, I know you cover Nick, and you're down the locker room. You cover his press conferences. And he does those things every once in a while where you go, why would he say this? He strangely wouldn't confirm Jurgens is going to be the center. What What are your thoughts on that? He did that last year, uh, too. Like, he wouldn't he wouldn't say that he was the right guard, if you remember. He, he Sometimes, not just Nick, but teams take competitive advantage to a uh, – yeah. to, to the, you know uh, – to a degree that's kind of ridiculous, but we all know that that he's going to be the center. I mean, and, and barring unless they draft somebody or, or right. something like that. But I, right. I mean, what, what do you gain? <laughs> what what do you really gain? Every, everybody knows that he's going to be the center. The question becomes who's going to be the right guard. That's the real question. No, because that was my thought. Because he did say he talked about Tyler Steen's versatility. Well, he really hasn't shown yet he could play right guard. He was a left tackle in college. Right guard, he as we outlined last summer the technique wasn't good he was really far behind with Jurgens. now I can understand why going to training camp he wouldn't name Jurgens the starter though anyone who was at OTAs would know Jurgens was clearly ahead but Jurgens had to win it he won it clearly had a good year other than the injuries a couple other takeaways Andrew and just to put people on this because we've outlined this guy now for this is his last year of his rookie deal if I'm not mistaken Kenny Gainwell again it's like he's his own son. He defends him like no other. And he talked about the toughness. And uh, I guess this one block of the chip against Aaron Donald, which was really good. You, you've covered game well since you've been covering the team. You, you know, Sir, you've got to know Sirianni through uh, everything he said and being around him. What are your thoughts on this Gainwell love here and why he continues to back up Kenny Gainwell? I don't like how, how he really liked 
Zach Pascal and you really like the Lamade Zacchaeus. He likes these tough, scrappy guys that are selfless and willing to do the dirty work and dependable. And and Kenny is not a game breaker. He doesn't have the 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 juice of some of the other guys that they have on the roster at the position. But he's a, he's a dependable guy and 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 you know two and four minute offenses. He's a, he's okay in pass protection compared to DeAndre Swift. He certainly has a long way to go though. Um, and and I I just think that that he likes uh, his toughness and his locker room presence and just his dependability. He obviously talked about uh, Saquon Barkley again, but the, the now the other one. This is in my this is in in, in my this is one of my pet peeves w- with Sirianni. Like it is he he's had he's talked three times since the season ended. Once where he seemed defeated after they lost to Tampa Bay, and him and Roseman were kind of tired. If you remember, it was like a week after the season ended. And he, he kind of gave it up. He had his meeting with Jeffrey Laurie and where they presented their plan going forward and they were going to have a new offensive coordinator and so forth. And that guy's going to call the plays. It's going to be his scheme. You know, that it's going to be a new guy's scheme. And that's when Tim McMahon has famously asked, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? I was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were there. So what, did, you, did you not laugh when, when Tim asked that in, in Nick's response? <laughs> it's like crazy. You know? <laughs> I I just didn't know uh, where Nick was going with his answer, but I, exactly. I, I understood what he was trying to say. He's you know he's going to try and oversee the operations as yeah. the CEO, head coach, right? Which he's been, but this is the right. even more so. But going forward, I, I I just assume you know we were told that Nick knew we had to it had to be the new guy's offense that he can't interfere, and. The bottom line is going forward here, the way that he was talking is like, oh, oh we're going to mesh our ideas together. Well, what does that mean? So exactly. what is your take? This is now the, the second time he said that in the last two press conferences. Is this a problem for you? Well, not at the moment, but the, he's mentioned this twice. Uh, if you remember, he said he said at the combine, too, and it was more of an eyebrow eyebrow raising comment on the heels of that end of the season press conference. And. I don't know how that's going to work because basically all by all accounts is Cal Moore's running the show offensively. Yeah. So Nick's going to have to find a way to to take a step back. He's very, he- he's been heavy handed in the offense. That's his, uh, he prides himself as being an offensive mind, but Cal Moore's going to run the show. I just don't know how apt he's going to be able to, to be, to, to kind of take a step back. He's probably going to give some sort of an input. I just don't know to what extent. Yeah. It was just kind of strange. that This is now twice. As he said that he's done this, uh, he's got to be very careful because, Mo- as I understand it, Moore's and Sirianni schemes are really different. And now, look, there's nothing wrong with having input. He has to have input. He's the head coach and he's an offensive guy. But you can't, you can't overrule the, the guy's scheme. Like the guy puts a scheme which is multi-dimensional, a uh, lot of motion shifting, and we'll, we'll see. We'll see what the, what this looks like. But that's what he's always done. So that was kind of interesting, and in, uh, 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 of how we talked about going forward. But you know, the only thing that that I think is really left is okay. Well, they're paying Barkley twelve and a half million. We know he's going to be the main ball carrier. He'll get most of the snaps. It's what happens in two minute, four minute goal line situations, uh, it, it, and stuff like that. Because you know you're paying Barkley all this money. You would think he'd be in in most of those situations, but that that's where Gainwell uh, is coming to place here. So we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, moving on to the next one, yeah, Howie Roseman spoke and, and Nick spoke Tuesday morning uh, at the coaches' breakfast. Where the uh, on Monday they had the AFC coaches' uh, breakfast, and then Tuesday the NFCs. And I like bouncing around, Andrew. I went from table to table. I, I sat in with Nick's for about ten of the maybe ten twelve minutes of his uh, half an hour that he spoke. Uh, but Howie Roseman also spoke to reporters, and he he talked about Barkley. Got it better, Andrew. I'll, I'll say this on. So, we you know we were asked for opinion, Jeff and I, about what what did we think it was a good idea to sign Barkley. What we said was the contract was kind of exorbitant for kind of coming off of a season that he did, but we understood that they saw him as a special player and how we talked about that. What you know, you 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 watched uh, Miles Sanders two years ago. You watched the running back situation with Swift last season. You and I haven't spoken about this, so I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are adding Saquon Barkley to the Eagles. Obviously, I like I like the signing because the, the the talent, at least on the surface, you're getting a three down running back that's going to alter the dimension of the offense. And Howie Roseman mentioned there's this misconception that he is, you know, not willing to pay running backs. And he alluded to Brian Westbrook and LaShawn McCoy. You, me and Jeff have mentioned that 
before and those are that was a long time ago and those were homegrown talents but this clearly tells you that he views Saquon as a game-changing type of player an elite talent and he's willing to pay for an elite talent we've mentioned Christian McCaffrey in the draft he would have been an eagle had the Eagles had the opportunity to get him players that he views as being game changers he's willing to to show out money for and at least he thinks and then and, and the, the franchise thinks they're getting a three down player that that's going to be able to step in, affect the, the receiving game, and be able to pass protect and do everything, stay on the field all the time. So we'll have to see. The health is going to be the main the main thing. Yeah, I would agree with you. The, the, one of the surprising things that, that, that come out of what Howie said, and I like when he gives this information out, and I have no reason to doubt it, is that, that uh, Devontae Parker pursued the Eagles. I thought that was interesting. That That, that is. He, yeah, I thought that was interesting because now they also have Paris Campbell – what are your thoughts, by the way, on Parker versus Campbell and on how they'll deploy both? Well, as a pure receiver, Adam, I liked I liked and I like Devontae Parker a lot better. Um, just to go up and get a type of receiver and above the rim guy. I like him coming out of Louisville. He didn't never really lived up to expectations. I think both guys are on the bubble, to be honest with you. That they they should be their names should be re- written in pencil when you're filling out your 53 man roster projections because okay. the roster's gonna look a lot different back in, you know, when we get to August. But I, I like Parker's ability to contribute more than I like Campbell's. Now, Campbell has some dynamic traits. He's probably better in space, and, and he's going to work the short to intermediate areas of the field. But not a volume guy. I wasn't really crazy about him coming out of the draft. Look, both guys are going to have an opportunity, and they're a low, it's a low-risk signing. And you sort of draft-proof your roster going into the draft so you don't really uh, – you don't have to overcommit to selecting somebody maybe earlier than you'd like at a position of need. Well said. And then he talked about Zach Bond. Now, he didn't mention Andrew Van Kinkle, but he basically said, well, a guy that Vic coached before, that Bond could be. And he was talking about Van Kinkle, who who we had noted on, a, on our pre-free agency show that the Eagles had interested in, interest in, and they and then Van Kinkle had interest in the Eagles. But uh, the money was too rich. He, he He's uh, the APY is it's 10 million each season. Now, there's not a lot of guaranteed money in year two, but there's, there's a lot of money in year one. And most teams, because Van Kinkle was coming off of a decent foot injury that they just teams were not willing to go there. Zach Bond really has not played very much. He's been a special teams player. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, Roseman talked about the value of the second quarterback. Uh, it, it's funny. And I, I, Howie eyes clearly, clearly knows what, when there's criticism of a player, he seems to love bringing that up. So he brought up the, 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 uh, the, the Bryce Huff stuff in terms of the run defense uh, that that was just funny how he, cause he's aware that people question that. So w- when you look at this free agency class, Andrew, let's sum it up. Pickett in a trade, the two receivers that you mentioned, Matt Hennessy, by the way, from Temple, mm-hmm. Bryce Huff. Uh, oh, I, I should add this. I talked to Rich Semini, who covers the Jets at ESPN.com. Rich said that um, you know, he's a smaller frame guy. That's why he's not a great run defender, but he's super explosive. And is I guess he's from Mobile, Alabama. And was not originally a invitee to the Senior Bowl, so out of Memphis, which is interesting. I don't know if he, he was actually a Shrine Bowl. I remember him from Shrine the Shrine Bowl. Bowl. Okay. Yeah. okay, so maybe he wasn't. Yeah, maybe he wasn't. it was actually the year that you and I were there, and we were and we were catching up. But that, okay. that was the Bryce Huff, and he didn't he didn't get invited to the combine. I believe his pro day was canceled because of you oh. know COVID. COVID. So wow. he had he had some some hurdles to clear just getting to this point. I didn't know he was at the Shrine practice. I don't even remember that. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he was he was dominant. Yeah. Well, we're we're gonna talk to Ryan Silverfield, uh, the former, well, actually not former, his former his his coach at Memphis, who's the head coach at Memphis, uh, still doing a great job there. In fact, they had a, one of the best years in in uh, Memphis history last season. Um. So look, they so when you look at this class, and we add Bond here again, we'll see, and uh, and 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 Owen Burks is my my dog Twiggy goes crazy above um do you think is it kind of do you have questions about this class see i have questions what do you are you like oh great class average class good class what, what are your thoughts overall on this class yeah we haven't we haven't even mentioned uh, cj gardner johnson who too, I think on the, is, on the is probably, yeah, is, probably the, yeah. is probably the best signing uh of, of the bunch just given his value as a versatile defensive back in, in vic Fangio's scheme but i have some questions at linebacker right i, I mean Devin White's an uh, an immensely athletic player, but volatile, very inconsistent. So you have to see if Vic Vanjo is able to hone in on on his athletic traits and put him in position to be successful. But uh, it's it's an upside signing. Maybe maybe he works out here. But 
uh, behind that, you have Oren Burks, and, and you mentioned uh, Bond being probably the, the edge rusher there. Uh, they've added bodies, but you have to see if it's going to be markedly improved from last season. That's probably where uh, my biggest question lies. Also, pass rush, right? We don't know what's going to happen with Hassan Reddick. You added a player in Bryce Huff who played 42% of the snaps, I believe, last year for, for the Jets. So you have to see how he's going to be able to handle an expanded role. Oh, and by the way, you have Nolan Smith who hasn't played much. He didn't play much as a rookie. And and, and Josh Sweat looked like he wore down down the stretch. So I, I, I do have some questions about the pass rush moving forward. Yeah, and Andrew, yeah, and that's the thing. I, I would say Gardner Johnson, just on paper, because he's been here before, I know the scheme, Vic Fangio's, scheme that he's running is his own it's like he's not running someone else's of his scheme so uh you would think it, it's actually going to be an upgrade here and you mentioned Devin White we'll see again he's come off of a, a very down season to say the least can he revive his career still a relatively young guy so yeah you know, look in the end uh, there'll be an opportunity here but there, there's still a lot of question marks with this class overall but I would say I would say Garner Johnson's to me and 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 obviously Barkley are the two best, but I would rank it Barkley one, Gardner Johnson two, Huff three. Uh, and, and the reason why I say Huff three, I have no idea what to expect because he's never been a full time starter. And then obviously Pickett is going to be a backup. We talked about the two receivers, Hennessy, who's a very kind of an underrated signing. He's been hurt a lot. A guy was a second round pick. We, we, we can debate whether he should have been or not, but he does have versatility. And we'll see how about Bond, who could play uh, inside or outside at linebacker. And, and we mentioned Burks, who Greg Cosell talked about when we uh, went over the Eagles signing. So we'll see about that. And before we move on to what Jeffrey Lurie said and the intel there and, and that discussion, let's take one more quick break. Okay, so whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with your fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you're going to love delivered right to your door. So you've resolved to actually sit down and eat dinner around the table. What do you do about those nights when your schedule is jam-packed? That's when you turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals. And that includes their 15-minute recipes designed to help minimize mealtime stress. Who doesn't like the sound of that? Every time we eat a HelloFresh meal, whether it's quick and easy or any of their other types, we are blown away by the freshness, the taste, and the overall quality. Tried so many great options. There's seafood, there's steak, there's chicken, vegetarian items, anything you want, HelloFresh makes it. And now they've got a great deal. If you go to HelloFresh.com slash Eagles free and use that code Eagles free, you get free breakfast for life. That's one breakfast item per box while your subscription is active Free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Eagles free. It's all one word, lowercase E-A-G-L-E-S-F-R-E-E. -E -E. And again, use the promo code Eagles free. Act now for America's number one meal kit. Sky Motor Cars in Westchester is a different sort of dealership. All it takes is one look at their Highline pre-owned vehicles that people over the country want to see. Owner Brett Shoulder, make sure you don't spend a dime of your money before you purchase the car. Sky Motor Cars allows you to make all the decisions regarding your next vehicle. At Sky Motor Cars, you never have to spend more than necessary. Visit SkyMotorCars.com today or call 610-918-7225. All right, welcome back to Inside the Birds. So, Andrew, Jeffrey talked late Tuesday afternoon, always thoughtful. He, he's a really good I, – I enjoy hearing him. Uh, public, doing public speaking. I know he doesn't speak very much, and sometimes you don't know when he's going to speak. The only time you know he's definitely speaking is at the orange meetings, but sometimes he talks, he gives sort of the state of the union, or so to speak, of the team. Sometimes when training camp opens, he's done that before, but he hasn't done that in a while. But anyway, you know, he 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 always, I love these buzzwords he comes up, up with. He talks about when he was asked about Nick Sirianni returning, what, what was the, he talked about, you know, there's a process that he goes over every season and he talked about no recency bias, because again, if you just went off the anger of what happened, if you, if you discounted, they were 10 and one, you know, they could have moved on without, without Sirianni because it was so bad. And it, it, you know, some people thought the team quit. We didn't think so, but it looked bad, but Jeffrey didn't do that. He took the process of going through the entire season. So 
Uh, as he said, he asked a lot of questions, his assessment of the team from what Sirianni Roseman said and what their plan was going forward. You, you've you've covered this team for a long time. What do you think of Jeffrey Lurie's regime? As uh, and obviously you've grown up here in the Del- Delaware Valley. What, what what are your thoughts on him as an owner? I, th- I think he's a I think he's a strong owner. I th- you could argue he's he, he's the best owner in, or among the best in, in the NFL. I I think that uh, his track record of, of success speaks volumes. His ability to uh, shell out whatever resources coaches need and identify you know, work in identifying talents. Uh, has been a, a hallmark of his and the, he, that that track record of success is what I what I often go back to when you look at Jeffrey Lurie there hasn't really been uh too many bumps in the road with him at the helm would agree he he's look they've been to um three Super Bowls unfortunately lost two of them we could argue whether should have, they should have they lost that game two years ago but they did and they, they have their one win they had the one uh the first one against New England which didn't go so well they blew that halftime lead uh, back in 2005, but uh, also he talked about sort of the trends and, and how they do st- contracts, which I thought was very interesting, by the way. I, it, he, you know, owners don't typically talk about that, but uh, and that that that's interesting. I thought I thought that was good and how they take advantage of inefficiencies. He was asked about Hertz's leadership. Um, what? So let me ask you this question because you're around Sirianni a lot, and you 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 know you you hear his press conferences, you're at them a lot. He talked about how Nick is self-critical of himself. And as we know, during the season, he talks about when he ta- when they talk about um, they got to drag the coaches, drag themselves through the mud when things aren't going right. What are your thoughts on Nick from, from covering his time here? We know he's had a lot of success, but overall, what are your thoughts on him? Competitive, um, stubborn to a degree, but someone uh-huh. who, but, but, but someone who does take it, take it on the chin and take it personal when, when he's, it comes up short. He, he's accountable for his shortcomings, I would say. And he's some of the players they, they, they fight hard for. I haven't heard um, any, any, any ill word about him. They, they rally behind him. And that was even evident. I never thought that the, that the level of play that they quit or anything like that, the players last season, I just thought that it, it just wasn't uh no one was on the same page. It wasn't good enough, but I, I think that they, uh, they all fight for him. And that's, that sort of speaks to the culture that he's established. And um, I'm just, this is a big year for him. There's no doubt about it. You know, there, there's uh, his, his name's uh, highlighted and, and all, all eyes are going to be on him to see if he's able to, do, to deliver because the roster has all the pieces in place, at least right now, most of the pieces in place to go back to the Super Bowl or at least make a deep postseason run. You think so? really as of now before the draft, you think they could actually make a run, huh? Yeah, I just think offensively they're going to be super tough to contend okay. with and, and teams are going to have to outscore them. And I just have a hard time envisioning that. Uh, well, as it stands right now, but there, sure. there's certainly going to be some more pieces added coming down the pike. Oh yeah, yeah, obviously the draft, but yeah, I, I would say this with better coaching, which which they're going to get, no question with the new coordinators and new assistants, it, it's certainly going to be better. But I, I'm just a little bit. Uh, Barkley, I, I believe, will bounce back because the line will be better. That's what Joe Banner actually said to me last week. Uh, although we, our Joe and I, we have different information on Barkley. I definitely agree with him that. And as you said, that you're getting a primetime player who's super explosive. So you got to think with this offensive line, though it may not be the elite one that used to be, still going to be one of the top three to five in the National Football League. And then he was asked about the uh, the, the kickoff change uh, rule. So I, it's really interesting, Andrew. When I when I got there Monday um, late morning, I was told this is going to be a three day process. It's not like your typical rule change vote where it's done in an hour or two, which done in a day, this is going to take three days. And it sure did, but it passed in a landslide. So Andrew, I got to ask before we get out of here, what are your thoughts of this new UFL or yeah, I guess you could go. Yeah. The, the former USFL, which is now the UFL. What are your thoughts of this new kickoff rule? Well, I, I like it. Yeah. I, I, I grew up through an era where the guys like Eric Metcalf, Dante Hall, uh, you know, Brian Mitchell, sure. they made the game exciting. You didn't want to, you don't want to leave your seat. You didn't want to, you don't want to go to your, you know, go to the kitchen and grab something. You want to always be able huh. to watch that the play because they they had the, the the ability to alter a game on any given touch. And now you have that ability. Now the players like Cordero Patterson, you saw him sign right after that rule was yeah. uh, was in place, by the way. Um, and and a guy like Isaiah Rogers, who still has to, yet to be reinstated, but really good returner. He now he all of a sudden he has added value. 
And yeah. also the, the, the other side of it, Adam, that I really am all for is that it all, it opens the door for back of the roster players to have more opportunities to make rosters. And I thought that largely that was taken away from them when they got away from that. And you were having, seeing a lot of starters on there and, and, and players like that. But now, you know, guys like, uh, you know, now you remember the days where they had guys like Brian Brayman and Jason Short and players like that, mm-hmm. that would, that would, that, that was their role and guys are gonna be able to kind of stick in that capacity. Yeah, and, and the thing is, and you were talking about the back end of the roster, and this is what Rich McKay said, who's the president of the Falcons is also the chair of the competition committee. It's always good when you could actually give the guys from 45 to 53, a better chance to make the football team. That's huge. Uh, and the special teams coaches, Darren Rizzi of the Saints and and uh, Bones Fossil talked about this at the Cowboys, that they go through this every summer because this is this is their part of the roster. There's the bottom, for the most part, starters aren't on special teams. Very few are, although Malcolm Jenkins sure did. Uh, but typically you don't do that. And you mentioned Isaiah Rogers, who it's no longer about, as he applied for Reed's statement, it's about will he, will he when and you know, will he be and when will it happen? Uh, we know with uh, reinstating players from suspension, it, there's typically a, an order of what the commissioner's given. Uh, he's got people who go over the case, case, and he goes over each one, and they they advise him of where this thing is at. Then he then he makes his ruling. It'd definitely be surprising if he's not reinstated. And because of the the back end of the roster doesn't have a lot of explosives, this kid could run, by the way, and he could play inside at outside corner. Uh, he could be a kickoff turn. In fact, if he if he's if he's on the roster, I'd be shocked if he's not the kickoff returner. With Boston Scott unsigned, but uh, doesn't look like he's coming back. It would be a, a small surprise if the Eagles resign him. Not that they don't have interest, but we know he's looking for a more meaningful. That's where we understand more meaningful role. So we'll see what happens with him uh, going forward. But uh, Andrew, good job today. We appreciate you doing this, and uh, we'll do it with you again very, very soon. For Andrew DiCecco and Jeff Mosher, I'm Adam Kaplan. We'll see you next time on Inside the Birds. Be sure to check out our friends at phlsportsnation.com. They're enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports teams. For the fan, by the fan is their motto. So make sure you check them out at phlsportsnation.com and on Twitter at phlsportsnation.